All right, welcome back again to the JFK assassination uh, audit video number 67. It's 27 February. We're going to go back to Mexico City, and this is episode is going to be named uh, Bishop's Mission. So we're talking about Maurice Bishop, who was also known as uh, David Atlee Phillips. And we're reading over his Spartacus article. It says on the 27th of November, Luis Achevera told Scott that he had rearrested Sylvia Duran because she was trying to leave Mexico for Cuba. Thomas Mann sent a message to Winston Scott that stated Duran should be told that as the only living non-Cuban who knew the full story, she was in exactly the same position as Oswald prior to the assassination. Her only chance of survival is to come clean with the whole story and cooperate fully. I think she shall crack when confronted with the details. Now, it's really interesting because, you know, basically, Duran is just like a Walmart cashier. You know, say Ted Bundy came into a Walmart before he went on his killing spree and bought a few things and maybe chatted with um, the cashier and then went out and did his dirty deeds. I mean, Sylvia Duran's about as guilty as that cashier. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. What they're doing is because Oswald's dead, they're trying to find someone to focus the blame on. Okay? And for some reason, they're, they're picking on her. Because I haven't seen any evidence linking her to anything. She's just some innocent bystander that just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Anyway, it says J. Edgar Hoover sent FBI agent Larry Keenan to Mexico City in order to have a meeting with Winston Scott, Thomas Mann, and Phillips. Mann sta started the meeting by expressing the belief that Fidel Castro and the DGI were behind the assassination of John F. Kennedy and that it was just a matter of time before the United States invaded Cuba. And see, they're pushing that same line that the hardcore conservatives want to push LBJ into invading Cuba. And they're trying to link Oswald to Cuba and the assassination of Kennedy to Cuba. However, Kennedy replied that Hoover, Lyndon Johnson, and Robert Kennedy all believe that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. And of course, Lyndon is saying that because they're trying to avoid a World War III there. Thomas Mann later told Dick Russell, It surprised me so much that was the only time it ever happened to me. We don't want to hear any more about the case and tell the Mexican government not to do any more about it, not to do more investigating. We just want it hushed up. I don't think the U.S. was very forthcoming about Oswald. It was the strangest experience of my life. So what we have is two opposing forces on the anti-Kennedy side, okay? So we've got the pro-invasion side, I guess you could say. The ultra-right-wing conservative anti-communists are trying to push LBJ into invading Cuba, just like they tried to push Kennedy into invading Cuba after the Bay of Pigs and after the or during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Now you've got the same elements involved, and they're trying to use this situation with Oswald because they set him up as an excuse to invade Cuba. LBJ is understanding it. He wants the power to be president, but he doesn't want, you know, to be a short 15-minute presidency because the whole world's been radiated. So this is what he's doing. He's trying to cut that off and cut off any investigation outside of just it was Oswald. All right. In reality, J. Edgar Hoover had not ruled out the possibility of a communist plot to kill uh, John F. Kennedy. At 1.40 on the 29th, Hoover told Lyndon Johnson on telephone this angle. In Mexico... This angle in Mexico is giving us a great deal of trouble because the story... There is the man Oswald getting $6,500 in the Cuban embassy 
and then coming back to this country with it were not able to prove the fact but the information was that there um, that he was there on the 18th of September in Mexico City and were able to prove conclusively he was out he was in New Orleans that day so again if you really think that Oswald got six thousand five hundred dollars do you think that he'd be living with his wife who was moved out because of his abuse and moved out because he wasn't providing for her him and the kid her and the kids do you really think Oswald's wife would be living with Ruth Payne do you really think that Oswald would be living in a separate rooming house I mean six thousand five hundred dollars is equivalent to about thirty forty thousand dollars nowadays that's about a year's income do you really think Oswald if he'd gotten that money from the Cubans would be living in his abject poverty that he's doing anyway and then the story says that on the 18th Oswald was still in New Orleans on the 18th anyway it says now then they've changed the date so the story came uh, in changing the date to the 28th of September and he was in Mexico City on the 28th now the Mexican police have again arrested this woman Duran who is a member of the Cuban embassy and we're going to confront her with the original informant who saw the money pass so he says and we're also going to put the light, de light detector tests on him so this is the Nicaraguan guy that's saying he saw Oswald you know with a Cuban agent passing him money in, in the lobby out in the open there I mean do you really think the Cubans are that stupid that if they're going to pay Oswald money, they're not going to do it out in the open in the lobby where any other, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry can see them with their illegal activities, you know, paying Oswald to kill the President of the United States. Just think how stupid that is. Just think how idiotic that is. That's just a blatant lie by this right wing Nicaraguan guy that's trying to tie this in. He's tied in with this other group of right-wingers in the United States and they're trying to force LBJ's hand into invading Cuba that's all that is okay that evening Fernando Gutierrez Barrios told Winston Scott Winston Scott is the station chief in in uh, Mexico City that Gilberto Alvarado had recanted and signed a statement admitting that the story of seeing Lee Harvey Oswald in the Cuban embassy was completely false. Remember, Gilberto Alvarado is the one with the fake story about seeing Oswald getting cash from the the Cubans. He's Nicaraguan. He said he his motives was trying to get the United States to act against Fidel Castro. There you go. A few days later, Gilberto Alvarado re reverted to his original story. He told his Nicaraguan handler that the only reason that he recanted was that his interrogators threatened to hang him by his testicles. However, soon afterwards, he recanted again. So he tells the story, he recants. He tells the story again, and then he recants. Phillips later claimed that Alvarado was dispatched to Mexico City by the Somoza brothers in what they considered a covert action to influence the American government to move against Cuba. Jefferson Morley argues that Phillips is being disingenuous. Phillips knew all along the Alvarado's service as a CIA's informant. Even the FBI knew all along he was under CIA control. So let's think about this again. Okay. Lee Atlee Phillips is head of Western Hemisphere covert operations for the CIA. Out of they're running out of Mexico City because they can't run it out of out of the U.S. So, Gilberto Alvarado is going to be one of the people in his, you know, in his con under his control. It says Sylvia Duran was questioned about her relationship with Lee Harvey Oswald. Despite being roughed up, she denied having a sexual relationship with Oswald. Luis Echeverra believed her, and she was released. However, Duran later admitted to a close friend that she had dated Oswald while he was in Mexico City. Wow. That Oswald, who's a total loser,
can't even take care of his own wife is Mr. Mr. Smooth James Bond when he's in Mexico City, living in his poor poverty shack and swooning a Cuban or Mexican who's working in the uh, the Cuban embassy. Doesn't make any sense. All the while, while living on his unemployment of, what, $25 a week? Anyway, David Atlee Phillips um, served as station chief in the Dominican Republic and in Rio de Janeiro. In 1970, he was called to Washington and asked to lead a special task force assigned to prevent the election of Salvador Allende as president of Chile. Allende was killed in a military takeover in 1973. So again, you know, it's not hard to see that David Atlee Phillips has lots of connections in Central and South America there. David Atlee Phillips' last assignment was the head of Western Hemisphere Division. He held the rank of a GS-18, the highest position in the CIA not requiring executive appointment. After he retired in 1975, he became the head of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, AFIO. In 1976, Antonio Vesiana was interviewed by Gaten Fonzi of the House Select Committee on the Assassinations. Vesiana, the founder of the anti Castro um, organization Alpha 66, told the committee about his relationship with the C Central Intelligence Agency contact Maurice Bishop. He claimed that in August 1963 he saw Bishop and Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas. Vesiana admitted that Bishop had organized and funded the Alpha 66 attacks on the Soviet ships docked in Cuba in 1963. So here we have the head of the anti-Castro, one of the anti-Castro groups, Alpha 66. His handler in the CIA is Maurice Bishop. Okay, David Atlee Phillips. He says that he was in Dallas going to meet David Atlee Phillips and coming out ahead of him was Lee Harvey Oswald at the same time that Lee Harvey Oswald was on his way to Mexico City. So he probably left Dallas going to Laredo. Now, when you listen to the FBI, they say, well, there were no bus tickets or no buses leaving from Dallas either before the 26th or after the 26th that were in the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, he could have used a fake, a fake name because, you know, you don't have to show ID. Or he could have had his contact, you know, this guy Albert Osborne drive him to Laredo. Or he could have had someone else drive him to Laredo. Anyway, it says Antonio Vassiano explained the policy. It was my case officer, Maurice Bishop, who had the idea to attack the Soviet ships. The intention was to cause trouble between Kennedy and Russia. Bishop believed that Kennedy and Khrushchev had made a secret agreement that the USA would, not, would do nothing more to help in the fight against Castro. Bishop felt, he told me many times, that President Kennedy was a man without experience surrounded by a group of young men who were also inexperienced and with mistaken ideas on how to manage the country. He said you had to put Kennedy against the wall in order to force him to make a decisions that would remove Castro's regime. Again, this goes exactly, almost word for word, along what I've been saying. That the ultra-right-wing conservative anti-communists didn't believe Kennedy either had the experience enough to handle the country and to, to counter the Cubans and counter the Russians, or they believed he was mildly in bed with them, maybe even pro-communist, which is a total ridiculousness. So they believed the only way to force Kennedy to act on Cuba and to remove Castro okay, was to do an invasion right at the beginning of his um, presidency to force him to act, which he didn't, or to force him to act when uh, 
you know, the Cubans brought in the Russian nuclear missiles, and he was able to get the missiles removed, so he didn't. So their next step was to remove Kennedy and then to force LBJ into the same exact situation up against the wall to invade Cuba. So what you have here are private individuals or government employees working for the CIA trying to change American policy of an elected official that they don't like or trust or understand. It says Richard Zweiker, a member of the committee, uh, speculated that Bishop was David Atlee Phillips. Schweiker asked his researcher, Gaten Fonzie, to investigate this issue. Fonzie arranged for Vassiana and Phillips to be introduced at a meeting of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers in Reston. Phillips denied knowing Vassiana. After the meeting, Vassiana told Schweiker that Phillips was not the man known to him as Bishop. Interesting. But again, we're talking like 15 years later, too. Gaten Fonzie was unconvinced by this evidence. Also, if you remember, a lot of people were ended up, you know, killing themselves, shooting themselves in the back of the head, uh, ended up in um, drum barrels floating around, chopped up in drum barrels floating around in uh, Biscayne Bay in Florida. So, Vesiana was not stupid. He also got shot in the head. So he has kind of an incentive not to confront um, Maurice Bishop and confirm that Phillips is the same person there, at least at that time. Gaten Fonsi was unconvinced by this evidence. He found it difficult to believe that Phillips would not have known the leader of Alpha 66, especially as Phillips had been in charge of the covert action in Cuba when Alpha 66 was established. So Phillips would have been the contact passing out orders, passing out money to the leaders of these organizations. So it's highly unlikely he would have known um, Vesiana as the leader of uh, Alpha 66. Especially as Phillips had been in charge of covert action in Cuba when Alpha 66 was established. Other information also emerged to undermine Phillips. Uh, CIA agent Ron Crozier, who worked in Cuba during this period, claimed Phillips sometimes used the code name Maurice Bishop. Phillips testified before the House Select Committee on Assassination on April 25, 1978. He denied he ever used the name Maurice Bishop. He also insisted that he had never met Antonio Vassiana. So when you're working covert operations, especially with these Cubans, when you don't know exactly, there could be pro-Castro sympathizers or infiltrators inside these groups. So when you're meeting with these groups, you don't want them to know exactly your real name. So you're going to use a cover name. I mean, it just makes sense. Okay? That's just part of the game there. Um, let's see. And also... If you're confronted about it, you're going to deny it, especially to a House Select Committee, which has really no authorization to override any kind of secret, top secret agreements that you have with the with the official U.S. government or the CIA. Phyllis published his autobiography, The Night Watch, 25 Years of Peculiar Service in 1977. The following year, he published Carlos Contract, a novel that dealt with political assassinations. Phillips also wrote The Great Texas Murder Trials, a compelling account of sensational T. Gullen Davis case. And if I remember correctly, the Carlos contract, let me see here, hold on, let's take a look at that. I think he even mentions Oswald in the Carlos contract. Let's take a look here, hold on one second. It's a fictional account, actually. Oh, well, wasn't able to find that, but I think that's the one. It's either him or Hunt that do a fictionalized version um, of them as a contact with um, Lee Oswald. Right. I have to 
clarify that, but I, I believe that's what it is. And so that's what they do is if you want to write about and boast about things that you've done in your life, but you can't legally do it because of your top secret clearance contract, you write about fix something fictionalized, okay? And that way you can boast about things that you did and brag about them. Anyway, it says, according to Larry Hancock, the offer of someone would have talked. Just before his death, Phillips told Kevin Wash, an investigator with the House Select Committee on Assassinations, my final take on the assassination is there was a conspiracy, likely including American intelligence officers. Some books wrongly quote Philip as saying, my private opinion is that JFK was done in by a conspiracy, likely including rogue American intelligence people. David Atlee Phillips died of cancer July 7, 1988. He left behind an unpublished manuscript, the novel. Oh, here we go. The novel is about a CIA officer who lived in Mexico City. In the novel, the character states, I was the one of those officers who handled Lee Harvey Oswald. We gave him the mission of killing Fidel Castro in Cuba. I don't know why he killed Kennedy, but I do know he used precisely the plan we had devised against Castro. Thus, the CIA did not anticipate the president's assassination, but it was responsible for it. I share the guilt. So again, like E. Howard Hunt, he talks about things that he knows, okay, but always tries to shift the blame away from himself, okay? So again, what he's saying is exactly the scenario I've been saying that I've come up with my with my research here is that this core group this interpend group of white mercenaries and white CIA operatives that were you know training in Louisiana and South Florida at no name key to kill Castro what the CIA did the rogue elements of the CIA the FBI and the and the uh, secret service and military just used that same group and turned them around to kill Kennedy. That's exactly what they did, and that's exactly what Maurice Bishop is saying. He's trying to distance himself, okay, because if he admits, if he or Hunt admit they were involved in the assassination of Kennedy, even though they're dead now, or even though they died, someone could come back later on, okay, not criminal charges, but sue their estate, okay, for hundreds of millions of dollars and bankrupt their estate, make their children bankrupt, you know, all these things completely wipe out their children, the grandchildren financially. And I think this is what they're thinking, why they tried to tell the truth because, you know, it all, the truth always comes out. So they're trying to tell the truth but lay the blame at someone else's feet and not their own. Because a lot of people say, well, how come they didn't say it on their deathbed? Yeah, I, I was part of it and I killed him. But because, again, it even mentions Howard Hunt here. It says in January 2004, E. Howard Hunt gave a tape interview with his son, St. John Hunt, claiming that Lyndon Baines Johnson was the instigator of the assassination of JFK and that it was organized by Phillips, Cordmeyer, Frank Sturgis, and uh, David Sanchez Morales. There you go. Again, you're going to want to talk about details of the assassination but lay the blame at someone else's feet. Okay? So I personally don't believe that Lyndon Baines Johnson organized the assassination. Okay? I think he came on board. In, in favor to let it happen and not stop it because he knew he would benefit from it. Okay. I don't think he organized it. I think he was just told about it and he said, okay, well, you know, let me know when the, you know, what can I do to help? And what his part of doing was helping was letting them know in advance at the end of September or the end of August that it was going to be in Dallas. Okay, and so he's steering JFK to Dallas indirectly. Okay, and then there's another group that's organizing 
the assassination, which he doesn't know the details because think about it this way, okay? If you know that an assassination is going to happen and you're going to benefit from that assassination, okay, you're going to want to know the least amount of details as possible. Just let me know the, a few things, but not everything, okay? Because now you have deniability. You can say, I didn't know it was going to happen on that day. I didn't know who was involved in it, okay? And then we have this confession of him in front of his girlfriend saying, you know, she asked him, you know, people were saying you were involved in the assassination. He got upset, went into a tirade, started yelling, hit his fist against the wall, and says, no, it wasn't me, but the big oil guys who organized, and the CIA, rogue operators in the CIA who organized the assassination, okay? There you go. And then once he found out about it, then when all the pressure started coming, you know, that there, this other thing, this other element that they were trying to, you know, add the sugar, the, the cake layer, the icing on top, not only to get rid of Kennedy, but to lay the blame at the feet of Castro, which would force LBJ, okay, into invading Cuba, and then therefore World War III with the Russians, once LBJ realized he was being forced up against the wall, that's when he got in control of this Warren Commission and blackmailed or coerced Warren and to let him know that, hey, these crazies are trying to force me into invading Cuba and that's going to start World War III, okay? Because we know that the Cubans were involved and the Russians and that's going to start World War III, and, and thus, Mr. Warren, the fate of billions of people in the world, the blood of billions of humans and millions of Americans lies in your hand. You have to narrow it down just to Oswald. Everything else, just forget. Okay? And I'm going to show you some proof of this later on when we get into this Albert Osborne, which is, right, you know, a couple of things after this. But, again, we've got... David Atlee Phillips, they're all different parts of this group. Everyone's carrying out their specific mission, but doesn't, may not know about the others, okay? Again, you know, it's just like, uh, the in, say, the invasion of D-Day. You've got the Canadians, they've got their beach to invade, they've got the British, the French, and the Americans, and inside the Americans, you know, you've got the Rangers hitting these coastal defenses. You've got other army groups hitting there. You've got the airborne troops landing and taking St. Mary Glees and all this stuff. But none of them, you know, the 82nd, a, a, a private in the 82nd Airborne's landing in St. Mary Glees doesn't know exactly where the Canadian army or the British army or the American army is going to land, okay? It's called compartmentalization. So if this guy gets captured, he can't give away the whole store and say, yeah, well, the Americans are going to invade with 10,000 troops here and the British are going to invade with 10,000 troops there at this specific point. He doesn't know all that, and that's on purpose for reason. It's the same thing with David Atlee Phillips, Cord Meyer, Frank Sturgis, David Sanchez Morales, and even Hunt and LBJ. Only people are only going to know what they need to know and nothing more. Okay? Like LBJ knows about the assassination, but he doesn't know that they're going to sucker punch him after the assassination to, to force him into invading Cuba. That comes later. Okay? He doesn't know this. That's why he goes along with it. They've the people that are doing this are very smart, and they've analyzed every single person that's involved, okay? Maybe 100, maybe 200. But the people that are running it and pushing it, I think are probably either CIA or rogue CIA or these oil guys. The oil guys are most likely are the ones that are running it, and they're the ones that are financing it, so... 
that's how you find out who's in charge is who's paying the money okay so that's what I believe that's what I found so far everything that I'm coming across says exactly that all right so we're gonna keep going and keep going down this line I'm gonna go back and uh, look at all these specific individuals and how they're related but anyway hold on one second now this one's really interesting this is from C-SPAN from September 26, 2014. It's Oswald in the CIA in Mexico City. This is Edwin Lopez and Dan Hardaway. They worked on the House Select Committee, and their specific role was to investigate Oswald's role in Mexico City. And uh, it's very fascinating. It goes on for about an hour or so, but very fascinating the things they say. So we'll get into it and break it up and see what we can hear here. Images that are captured in that poetry of the United States. Watch all of our events from Colorado Springs today at 2 Eastern on American History TV on C-SPAN 3. The Assassination Archives and Research Center marked the 50th anniversary of the release of the Warren Report on the assassination of President Kennedy with a conference focusing on what they refer to as five decades of significant disclosures. In this 75-minute conversation, investigators Edwin Lopez and Dan Hardway detail their time in the late 1970s working for the U.S. House Select Committee on Assassinations and a report they co-wrote entitled Oswald, the CIA, and Mexico City. I've been joined by two people who are relevant to the story if we think in terms of a succession of stations or stages, places where we're standing on solid ground. These two gentlemen are, are responsible for significant developments which placed us in a place where we had not been before and which are unambiguous and un undeniable. Uh, their work as investigators for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, their interviews and interaction with George Jonides, who was brought out of retirement to act as an intermediary between the CIA and the pesky congressional investigation, investigating the broad daylight murder of a popular sitting president, uh, and their authorship of either the Hardway Lopez report or is it the Lopez Hardway report? It's just no. It's really, really the Blakey, the Goldsmith, the Fonzi, yes. Hardway Lopez report. Okay. That's what it is. Yay. It's my honor to introduce Dan Hardway and Ed Lopez. Thank you. Uh, I am Dan Hardway. Uh, I know you would be hard pressed to tell that I was Dan and this was Ed Lopez by just looking at us. But it's always been that way. He's the Spanish guy. I am. Uh, but that's a long story for a different forum. Uh, and Ed is an honorary hillbilly. <laughs> I had I had the distinct privilege of working for and with or for Bob Blakey and with Ed Lopez uh, from 1977 to 1978 on the House Select Committee on Assassinations. It was my honor and privilege to be able to assist Ed in preparing the Lopez report. <laughs> and, and to work for Bob, uh, Ed and I both were students at Cornell and accompanied Bob to DC from Cornell, took leaves of absence and worked on the committee. Uh, I know you're all expecting Bob to be here this morning, and he was supposed to be here this morning. However, he was unable to get here until tomorrow, so he will be p appearing tomorrow afternoon. I do have a statement that is basically a summary of his statement that he was going to make this morning that I've been asked to read on Bob's behalf as part of this presentation. So if you will bear with my reading skills, and uh, I will try to read Bob's statement to you. Uh, the title of it is The HSCA and the CIA, The View from the Top. Uh, and it begins, in the fall of 1962, the CIA had a problem. The Cuban Missile Crisis had ended with a peaceful resolution. 
you most go. Americans have been greatly relieved, but the organization that the CIA considered the, to be the single most popular Cuban exile organization was very upset with the American government. Yep. That organization was the Revolutionary Student Direct Directory, usually referred to by the initials DRE, representing its Spanish name. The and there you go. We're going to find a lot of the people involved in the assassination were in this Interpen DRE group. Now, again, they can't use Cubans running all over Dallas firing from buildings, okay, because that would be too damn obvious. You already saw the Dallas police were arresting any, you know, person that wasn't white, that was black, Hispanic. They were just throwing them all in um, <clears throat> the uh, the police cars. There's numerous pictures of that. So, to use a bunch of Cubans running around Dallas, white, 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 white Dallas, white conservative Dallas, firing guns and carrying rifles would be almost impossible. So they use the Cubans in support roles. And the people above them, the CIA mercenaries and contractors with this Interpen group, that's what it seems like to me. I've been coming across these documents. That's basically what it, they're saying here. And this is what he's saying. But the impetus for this was the DRE group, this anti-Castro group that, you know, they think that Kennedy screwed them at the Bay of Pigs. Which really, in reality, you know, it's weird how people can see things from the reality of something from 20 different ways. The reality is they had already planned the Bay of Pigs before Kennedy was even elected. Okay? They expected Nixon to be president. Nixon was the vice president under Eisenhower and the head of this Operation 40, which was the elimination of Castro. So they expected Nixon to be president. When Nixon didn't win, and believe me, it was a very close election, then Kennedy came in. They decided to go along and go ahead with the Bay of Pigs, even though they knew it wouldn't be successful, and they figured they could sucker punch Kennedy into providing air support and providing the Marines to invade Cuba. They figured he was a young, inexperienced man, we're talking like just a few months into his um, into his presidency, okay? So this is what they're talking about. This is what's going on. Again, you're going to see these connections, these um, mentioning of this group and all these things about Cuba. And like I said, after Bay of Pigs, you had the Cubans, the Mafia, a lot of these racists and maybe a few people in the in the rogue elements of the CIA that wanted to get rid of Kennedy. But after, I believe, you know, not like Oliver Stone that it had to do with just Vietnam. Uh, that was part of it, according, uh, you know, with other, a lot of other more things. But I believe the impetus for Kennedy's assassination started the day after the missiles started being removed from Cuba. Because that was their figure, their last chance to get Castro. Their, you know, the whole right-wing conservative element of the military and the intelligence group was trying to get force Kennedy into invading Cuba. And he knew that it would have been a disaster. That's why he had the embargo or the blockade. And he made these secret agreements with Khrushchev, which these secret agreements through this newsman with this other KGB agent only emphasize or magnified the paranoia of the right wing that Kennedy was somehow in bed with the communists and making secret deals outside of the State Department, outside of the CIA, and that Kennedy couldn't be trusted, and God knows what else he might be doing in negotiations with, this, with the, uh, the Russians. Anyway, we'll keep going. The DRE was a direct descendant of a Cuban student group founded in Cuba with the help of CIA agent David Phillips. The week after the missile crisis... You see? There's David Phillips again. <clears throat> You're going to have all these connections. The same people keep showing up again and again and again. 
David Phillips was seen talking with Oswald before he went to Mexico City by, by Vaciana, who's the head of Alpha 66. David Phillips started the DRE. The DRE was essential in the assassination of Kennedy. Ended. The DRE provided information to the Washington Evening Star newspaper that there still were missiles hidden in Cuba. The story ran with a front page headline. Twelve days later, the Secretary General of the DRE appeared on NBC's Today show where he once again claimed to have seen with his own eyes nuclear missiles hidden in the caves and hills of Cuba. And they were. Richard Helms was then the Deputy Director of Plans for the CIA. As such, he was in charge of the clandestine services, political warfare, and covert operations. As such, he did not want to lose the agency's influence with the DRE. Most of the funding for the organization was provided. Because the deal between Kennedy and Khrushchev was to remove the medium and inter intermedium range missiles. Okay? Kennedy didn't know about the tactical nuclear missiles or, or weapons and the um, the ar nuclear artillery that the the Soviet troops controlled there. There's even a fight after the missiles are removed that Khrushchev, I mean, excuse me, that Castro threatened Khrushchev to send in his troops to the military bases where the Soviet troops were at that had control of the nuclear weapons and forcibly take them from the Russians, which caused a big fallout between Khrushchev and the Cubans. Okay? But eventually, eventually, after the deal is made, JFK and Robert Kennedy find out about these tactical weapons. What we're talking about are small tactical, you know, 500 kiloton, 250 kiloton, um, short-range missiles, you know, 300, 400 miles that could hit miss that could hit ships as they were coming into Cuba. They also had them on, you know, these artillery shells that had small tactical nuclear weapons, about 100 kilotons, 50 kiloton, enough to to wipe out any invasion force on a beach. Okay. So these missiles were never removed. This is the reason we never, LBJ never, ever again tried to go into Cuba. Because he knew these, they eventually found out these missiles were there through the DRE. But once the deal was done, people were, you know, there was a sigh of relief. They didn't want to get back into it about these small tactical uh, nuclear weapons, so they let it go. Okay? And besides, you know, we had tactical nuclear weapons in Germany, right up to East Germany. We had tactical nuclear weapons, you know, in Turkey. So to, to go after those tactical nuclear weapons and battlefield nukes, we'd have to admit that we had them also. And we weren't about to do that. Again, those nuclear weapons were there, even in Greece and Italy, to stop a... a a Warsaw Pact invasion into Turkey, into Greece, and into Italy, and even into Germany. A lot of people don't know this, that we didn't have enough armor to stop the Soviets if they chose to mobilize and invade. It was impossible. They would have outnumbered us three, four, five to one. The U.S. always relied on, since the very, very beginning, on tactical and short-range nuclear weapons to take out these massive Russian tank formations. That was a part, a secret part of American strategy all along. The Russians knew this and therefore they were willing to sacrifice the Czech, the Hungarian, and the Polish troops first to let them go in and get nuked. And then the Russian troops who run in after them or around, or around them. Anyway, we'll keep going. Provided by the CIA, but they were pr proving to be a difficult organization to control. Helms summoned the Secretary General of the DRE to Washington for a face-to-face -face meeting. As a result of that meeting, Helms told the DRE that he would appoint a case officer 
who would be personally responsible directly to Helms for the work with the DRE. David the Atlee Phillips. Helms chose was George Joannides. Oh, George Joannides. We know me. from the limited information that has been released about Mr. Joannides that his work with the DRE was considered to have been very good and successful. He began working with the group in late 1962. His second specific duty was serving as a case officer for a student project. Now, a lot of people don't know this, that George Joannides was the CIA's, uh, what do you call it, um, liaison between the CIA and the House Select Committee. And also, a lot of people don't know this, that George Joannides was the organizer, I mean, just like, what, a year or two later, after the House Select Committee in 1979 when the Russians invaded, um, actually even before the Russians invaded, excuse me. So there was a, a communist coup in Afghanistan in 1978. They overthrew the king. Maybe 77, 78, they overthrew the king, okay? And it was a pro-Soviet communist group of Afghans that took over. There was a resistance Mujahideen group resisting this communist government that in itself got eventually invaded and thrown out by the Russians. But before then, there was a small arms um, supply train coming from, through the C, from the CIA through Pakistan into Afghanistan to resist this communist group, this organization, this supply train, was headed by George Jornides. And then eventually, you know, you've seen this movie, I can't remember the name of it, but where this Democratic um, congressman from, from Texas finds out about this operation, starts funding it, and then, you know, then the Russians invade, he funds it even more, and they were just totally destroyed. And then they supply him with stingers. This is George Joannides. They show him the character. I can't remember exactly his name, but the actor who played him was in this uh, Hunger Games movie. Um, but that was George Joannides, same exact guy. So he's used to running these, you know, the same operations he ran, supplying weapons to the Cubans. He turned that around and was running operations in a, you know, supplying weapons to anti-communists in Angola for UNITA and mainly for the Taliban against the Soviets because the way they saw it, after, especially after Vietnam, they were going to let, you know, use proxy armies to bleed the Russians and let them bleed. And this is exactly what we're doing in Ukraine, okay? We're not giving the Ukrainians enough weapons to destroy the Russians. We're giving the Ukrainians enough weapons uh, weapons to bleed the Russians to death, okay? Because if you destroy the Russians, then that gets the patriotic hackles going back in the home country and makes it harder to defeat them. If you bleed them to death, that means body bag after body bag of young 18, 19-year-old Russian boys coming back to their mothers, picking them up, and burying them and then that gets on the news media. If you do that, that'll get a, a leader overthrown. Okay? So that's what they're doing in Ukraine. That's why they're not giving them fully enough weapons. Because if they gave them all the weapons they wanted, then it would turn into a NATO versus Russia. But anyway, that's, they're using the same tactics against the Russians in Ukraine that we use against the Russians in Angola and the Cubans in Angola also. And the Russians in Afghanistan. Same exact tactics. Project involving political action, propaganda, intelligence collection, and a hemisphere-wide and a hemisphere-wide apparatus, the DRE. By January 1963, he was commended for quote resolving complicated problems involving control of this unruly group. Close quote. In July of 1963, his fitness report noted that Joannides has done an excellent job in the handling of significant student exile group, which hitherto had successfully resisted. And I also wanted to say something on the side here, that so 
you, you'll see there's funding for this DRE group and Alpha 66 all the way up to about this time that they're talking about, 1975-76, and then the funding completely gets cut off. What we see happen after that is a massive, massive uptick on the importation of cocaine from South America. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, the weakening of the Colombian government and their military. Actually, three or four reasons. The rise of um, various, especially the Mendelin um, cartels with cocaine. Also, these former Cubans who had been fighting Castro needed money to continue the fight against Castro. They got cut off by the American government and so their only alternative, at least to them, was to import cocaine, cocaine, was to smuggle cocaine, use that money. We see exactly the same scenario happen with Iran-Contra 10 years later, but their only source of financing for their group, for their lifestyle, and to fight Castro was to smuggle cocaine, and we see a, a massive increase in the uh, smuggling of cocaine through Panama, all the same areas that these groups were working in. Now, I'm not saying it was just the anti-Castro Cubans that were, you know, smuggling cocaine, because it wasn't. There were many other groups involved, but they joined the group. They joined those groups to get involved in that, to get private funding, and you see a reflection of that as I said, 10 years later in the Iran-Contra as they tried to privatize the funding um, for the Contras. Same exact scenario. And then that's when we have the cocaine, all this massive intake of cocaine coming into the United States. And we have these cocaine wars. You see the rise of gangs and, and inside the United States, especially in South Central Los Angeles and in Florida. And I'm not saying the CIA was officially involved in that like they try to say um, but, you know, you can understand a lot of these CIA case officers looking the other way because their sympathies are for the anti-Castro Cubans against Castro. They have no funding, you know, coming through the Carter years and, you know, the beginning of the Reagan years. And so that's what they, that's what they did. And we see, you know, we see the result there. Anyway, keep going. This did any important degree of control. That's a quote again from his fitness reports. He was promoted to take over as head of the political warfare branch of the CIA's Miami station. In other words, he became the manager of the propaganda operations and the only operation that he retained, the only operation, running operation, that he retained under his direct control was the DRE. The Assassinations Record Review Board released the copies of Joe Anides' fitness reports from the, that the agency turned over to them. From the start of his work with the DRE in the fall of 1962, there are quarterly reports until July of 1963. The next released fitness report is dated May 15, 1964 and covers the period from April 1, 1963 to March 31, 1964. In that time, he has been promoted again to head the, cover, uh, the covert action branch of the Miami station while remaining the senior case officer for DRE. The report praises Joe Anides for the quality, in quantity, quality and quantity of his propaganda and political action programs and his ability to translate policy directives into meaningful actions by all of his assets. Okay, so when he's saying assets, okay, so if you, you can imagine it like this. Here's Joe Anides here, okay, and then there's going to be above him David Atlee Phillips, Okay, so David Atlee Phillips is head of the anti-Cuban operations in Western Hemisphere anti-communist operations. Underneath him, you know, it's going to be like a division chief. You've got a guy that handles accounting, a guy that handles maintenance, a guy that handles personnel. This is what we're looking at, okay? So you've got Joe Anides, who's handling specifically the anti-Castro Cubans. The money's flowing, okay? from Phillips to Joe Anides, Joe Anides passing out this money, 
and intelligence and information to these different groups Alpha 66 the DRE um, and even and then on top of that between Joe and Edie's and these anti Castro Cubans you got the Interpin group Operation 40 guys the in, Jim, JM wave with the white guys the white mercenaries the white conservatives in their training the Cubans here so this is what he's talking about here you got Joe Nini's is the linchpin above all of these people. Okay, he's providing them intelligence. He's providing them with funding. He's getting feedback to go to his senior operations. Now, Joe Nini's may or may not have been involved in the assassination. It could have just been people below him. But I would say that since he was above them. There's no way that the planning could have occurred without him or Phillips knowing about it. As most of you know, it was in this period in August of 1963 that Lee Harvey Oswald had an encounter with the DRE's representatives in New Orleans. There you go. That encounter resulted not only in widespread publicity in New Orleans at the time, including newspaper articles, television coverage, and radio interviews, it also resulted in the first reports trying to tie Lee Harvey Oswald to Castro after the assassination of John Kennedy. There you go. DRE, their information, had their information the day of the assassination, and it was covered in both the Miami Herald and the Washington Post the next day. Headlines in both papers. The DRE published the details of what they knew in their own paper that week. The CIA never told the Warren Commission about their support of or work with the DRE in 1963. To my knowledge, the CIA never told the Church Committee about it. The ARRB asked the agency about DRE at the suggestion of Jeff Morley. The CIA initially told the, AARB, the ARRB the same thing they told me in the HSCA. The agency had no employee in contact with DRE in 1963. Hmm. The ARRB conducted its own examination of CIA records and found... All right, so we're going to stop there, okay? Um, but, again, like I said, I really believe that the upper levels of the CIA, FBI, Secret Service had no idea about the assassination. And the reason I say that is you're going to see... FBI investigations getting really intense and extensive into these various people and various groups and they wouldn't be doing that if they were already involved and they knew who was what and what was who okay so like I said it's sort of like that group um, Hydra okay and you've got Hydra you know from the uh, the Marvel comics they're just neo-nazi group this ultra conservative neo-nazi fascist group and they use like they use the nazis okay and like uh what do you want to like a parasite inside the nazi organization and they were able to manipulate hitler and the nazi organization there but then later on they join up with this avengers group um and they're inside the Avengers group, okay, I forgot what the guys, that organization was called, um, but anyway, there was a group of human, regular humans that controlled the Avengers, okay, but the group that controlled that group from the inside was infiltrated was the Hydra group, this neo-Nazi, maybe alien group or whatever you want to call it, and they used the structure of this organization to carry out various things that they wanted done in their agenda, okay, while using a law enforcement group that was supposed to carry out good, there was Hydra involved in it and controlling him from the inside. So not as nefarious, but very similar to that scenario, you have this group of ultra-conservative, right-wing, anti-communist, um, members, uh, which I've been calling the organization, um, you'll hear, you know, Prouty, he'll say, he'll call it the secret team, um, you've got other people nowadays, they call it the, um, 
uh, what do they call it? The uh, ah, I can't remember the name right now, but so you have this group inside these other groups. Okay, they're all connected. So you have ultra right wing conservative members of the Dallas Police Department, the CIA, the FBI, the Secret Service, the Mafia, the anti Castro groups, the old, the big oil guys. Okay, all these groups are related to each other. In this, they have similar goals. They're anti-communists. Eventually, they become completely anti-JFK. Uh, they may not all be involved in the assassination, okay, or even know about the assassination or organizing or the assassination, but they're all sympathetic to getting rid of JFK, okay. So if you think about it, I'm trying to think of a an example here. So. You may have, um, not picking on any particular religion, but you may have members of your church, okay, or your religious group that you're involved in, and they have a certain philosophy in their mind, okay, whether they're Catholics or Baptists or Pentecostal or whatever. But members of that church or that group, nothing nefarious, just, just use an example, may be members of the police department or the fire department or they may work for city hall or they may be in the uh, the media or the tv station or the newspaper or they may be college professors but they're all part of this religious organization okay that occupies these people's mind and the way they think and the way they operate and the way they see the world okay because you know i mean Let's just get down to it. A Baptist is going to see things differently and see the world differently than a Muslim or a Sikh or a Buddhist. Not that one is better or worse than the other, or one that's, you know, gooder, I guess you could say, than the other, but they're going to have a different philosophy of seeing things. Okay? But a Baptist could be a policeman a Buddhist could be a policeman a Muslim could be a fireman a Muslim could be working at City Hall okay a you know a Native American could be teaching at a college and all that internal philosophy is going to affect the way they see things the way they live their life for good or bad mostly for good that's what I'm saying here is you've got a group of people of like-minded when I say like-minded I mean inside their mind this is where their mind is that communism is creeping around and infiltrating the the US involved at every level trying to take us over and destroy the United States especially from within and that Kennedy is either ignorant or not experienced enough or he's part of the plot or being manipulated by people around him okay that he isn't aware of to take down the United States this is their mentality and they're existing within the Dallas Police Department they're existing within the CIA they're existing within the FBI the Secret Service the military the State Department, people of like minds, okay? I mean, you didn't have this group meeting in D.C. of CIA and oil people and FBI agents meeting and playing cards just because they like playing cards, okay? They were meeting for to discuss the current political situation because they were of like minds, okay? That's the way most people were back then. That's the way most people are nowadays, especially with the Internet. If you think about it, all your friends are people that you most likely agree with politically. That's why you have all these, you know, these MAGA people that vote for Trump when they say, you know, of course the election was stolen because everybody that I knew voted for Trump. Well, of course, because they've eliminated opposition or people that disagree with them from their Facebook page, from their life. That's the way we are. We get tired of fighting, 
I know I've done the same thing. I went in and had to eliminate people, block people, that just constantly fighting with, just constantly for years, and never change, and never see eye to eye, okay? So that's what people are doing in the Kennedy assassination. They're meeting with people of like minds, we're calling it the organization. There's going to be a core group of 1020 that are pushing the assassination and funding it and then giving out missions. Okay, you're in this CIA here, you're handling this group, get these guys organized. You're in the FBI, you're in the Dallas Police Department, we're going to need you here. And it could just be as simple as, hey, dude, you know, um, you've always been there for us, we need you at this moment to do this. And they don't have to tell them everything that's going on. It's just, look, look the other way, let Ruby in the basement, you know, there's this guy that's coming, just look the other way, pretend like you don't see him, you know. It could be just as simple as that. So there's lots of people that are helping out in the plot that don't realize they're involved in the plot, okay. That's my assumption. Again, like I said, there's probably 10, 20 people that are the lead coordinating committee, I guess you could say. And maybe a couple from the CIA, a couple from the FBI, a couple from Texas, a couple from the old group, a couple from the mafia, and a couple from the Cubans. And then under their organization, they've got a few people that may know a few things, but not everything. So you're, depart you're compartmentalizing it, okay? And it's not to the very, very end that the Cubans that are, or the people that are selected for the assassination team know exactly when, what, and how, and how it's going to happen. But still, a lot of them don't even know exactly everything, and they don't even know who's giving the orders at the top. That's the way I see it. That's the way you would run an organization like that. Because you wouldn't want the guy, you know, you wouldn't want the dark complexion man with the radio sitting in Daily Plaza with the umbrella man. You wouldn't want him knowing who's funding, who all the members of the assassination team are, who the members of the, the cover and counterattack team are, who the members in the Dallas Police Department and the CIA and the FBI and the Secret Service that are on the assassination plot team. You wouldn't want him knowing that. You wouldn't want him knowing who's funding and coordinating the operation from the top. Okay, the least he knows, the better. Anyway, that's why I never, when someone comes in to the assassination and they say they know everything and they met, you know, they met 10 of the conspirators all in a room all at one time, I throw them out and say, bullshit, it's impossible. Because no one's going to be that stupid to spill the beans to some lowly, you know, street person or personally bringing money or packages or whatever. It's just impossible. Anyway, we're going to move on here. Hold on a second. All right, so we're going to continue with our little Mexico City embassy tour. And again, it's just to look at security, get kind of an idea of what we're looking at here. This is the Saudi Arabian embassy. Now, I'm you know, um, Oswald most likely didn't visit the Saudi Arabian embassy. But again, you can kind of get an idea of where it's at. You got the Russian embassy over here. Um, you got the Cuban embassy up here. This is this little hilly area where the Vietnamese and the Iranian embassy is at. Kind of a nicer little area. Here is the Saudi embassy. Hold on one second. So it looks like it's in a quiet little neighborhood here. You got the Kuwaiti embassy almost right across the street. I'm sure there are other Middle Eastern embassies in this area. Yeah, there's the embassy of Iraq, another one of Kuwait. There's a Hungarian one. There's the, the Haitian embassy there. Okay, so let's take a look at this from the God's Eye point of view. Looks like it's right off a major road here. This is what, some kind of underpass here? All right, so it looks like it encompasses this entire area here. 
Let's take a look. Hold on one second. Alright, so we're just going to have Street View. So, this is how you can, can, can tell what's controlled by a private group and what's open. Is wherever Street View is at, that's open. Wherever it's not, that's privately controlled. They can't get in there. So you can get an idea that most likely this whole section here is the embassy of Saudi Arabia. Now let's take a look inside the embassy here. We've got photos. Yeah, there's some kind of reception area. Somebody's going to give a speech at the podium. That looks like the front front reception door. They're going to have some kind of DJ party, dance party of some kind. Here's Street View. All right, so we'll go to Street View. And first, let's go up to the main street here. You see they got Mexican police here. Now, unlike all our other people, Saudi Arabia has a lot of enemies, okay? And a lot of enemies that would not be shy about using terrorism to hit them, okay? So, like, Iran, Yemen, even Iraq would be enemies of Saudi Arabia, okay? And, again, you can see the security is completely up on this. You see how they've got these plants, these trees? They planted these trees along here and then in between around the trees they put these uh, concrete little boxes this is to prevent any kind of truck punching through now you can see this is a private residence this is a private residence you can see from the gate there and then it looks like yeah it looks like the embassy is going to end right there. So that's the end of the embassy wall. Now you see yeah interesting. Now they've got they put up this sign for no parking. That's for a reason because you don't want someone leaving a car out here and then they can remotely blow it up. You know it may not punch through the walls but at least it'll cause a lot of chaos. And you see you've got you know, you've got your cameras here. I'm surprised that wall is a not not a lot higher. That is surprising. But again, you've got groups like Hezbollah. You've got even Al Qaeda. ISIS would be opposed to the Saudi regime, and therefore they would probably be be doing looking for Sar. Look at, looking for soft targets, okay? So it's one thing to hit a, the Saudi embassy in Germany where there's going to be a lot of uh, security or maybe the UK or another Arab country um, like Kuwait. That's a whole different kettle of fish. It's going to be a lot harder to hit them there. But ISIS, Hezbollah, they're going to look for soft targets, okay? So like country countries like Mexico, you know, um, Colombia, places like that would be easier to hit them. This is kind of an odd door. I guess it's an entrance door, but also, but it's not very well fortified. But I believe that is part of the embassy here. And again, you see how they've got, it's weird that they haven't concreted these around here, these trees. Huh. Is this the embassy? Let's see. That's the Kuwaiti embassy there. And you see how they've got a little box here for the Mexican police? They even have almost it blocked off, as you can see. So no one's probably going to be allowed down this street. 
unless they're checked out by the Mexican police. I'm surprised they don't have a a gate across there. Now here's the walls. Kind of a low security for the Saudis. Again, the threat level. You see how the you see this? There's the Kuwaiti embassy. They got heavy concrete blocks on the bottom of the wall and a very high wall, about 20 feet. And then here's the Saudi embassy. They've got bushes and a wall of maybe 10 feet. So that tells me that the Saudis, they've done their own security evaluation and they believe that in Mexico City, their risk of it being attacked is very low. So that's what it's telling me right there. So, I mean, yeah, look at these open windows and these, even though the blockhouse is quite a ways away. But I guess they're, they're figuring they've got enough police and walls that, you know, it doesn't warrant what's happening with Kuwait there. Now, see, Kuwait, yeah, that's another situation there. Wow. Let's take a look here. Now, this is the front door. You see, they've got a little better security situation here. But still, I'm really surprised at the lack of, like, posts or blocks to keep vehicles away. They've got security camera, got a big steel mesh door. You can see there's the um, uh, control booth there. They got bulletproof glass, most likely. Let's see, do they have electric wiring? No electric wiring, very strange. So again, the Saudis have done a security evaluation and figured that their risk of being attacked here is a lot less than the Kuwaitis, I guess. Um, anyway, there's another entrance here. More security cameras. This is a private residence, it looks like. Yeah. Now, another thing is that there has been incidences where a private residence has less security than the embassy next door, and the embassy has less security on its wall between that and the private residence than the street level. So there has been incidents where the terrorists would attack the private residents, punch through, and then use that to get inside the embassy to the less secure wall there. Not very often, but uh, it can happen. But yeah, man, the, the Kuwaitis are just all over it on their security. Anyway, all right, so we're going to, that's enough of that, and we've got past our 115, so we're going to stop here. All right, take care.